next presentation will be a co-production between uh, Adi and Peiraj, who actually did all the work on head reduction system, who happens to be here, and uh, myself. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, reiterating what John already has said, that Jim, you are the, the most gentle and most modest person I ever know in science. Uh, your leadership is the way how we should do it everywhere. Uh, I followed your advice and uh, my uh, advisor and the Graf Scherz advice also that whenever I have somebody in the lab, the first thing to do is to disassemble the lab and have <coughs> novice put them together. Because this is how you learn how to turn knobs and things like that. So I came to the United States in 1979 and the very first laboratory I visited was your laboratory. And uh, whenever I came back to that lab, I always got a little disappointed because I came with enthusiasm and said, this is what I found. And they showed me graphs that they have already published or that was somewhere else. Uh, so the, 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 our paths have crossed many, many times. And this was probably the first significant event that we, we many of us went to. And uh, many people in the room are actually uh, there. That was the first so-called Western hippocampus meeting. And uh, there were some of the dis displayers here. Now, of course, we were all lost in terms of direction. So we ask you to show us the way. And you can see that Jim is already pointing forward. And uh, then uh, at least uh, John Kuby went to the Rockies and uh, said, OK, now this is so complicated around us, uh, which direction we have to go. And this was all, of course, before we, we or you knew anything about head direction cells. So the head direction cells were just I want to make sure that you had, everybody understands history. Uh, this is my history. The discovery of head direction cell was first debuted way before the Anaheim meeting, four months before. This is the meeting I organized. This was my first meeting I organized in, in, in for Andre Groschan, my mentor. Uh, there were several uh, wonderful people here. You can recognize uh, probably if you retro project the look from today to the old days mm -hmm. that uh, that those days we had time and we had respect to each other's talks. The talks were never clocked. And then after the meetings, in, well, after the, the talks, actually, there were many questions. And not only there were questions, but we wrote down the questions and the answers. So all the discussions were documented. And they are, they are interesting reads. So this is the very first head reduction <coughs> cell that the world has seen. And this was shown by Jim Rank at, at this meeting. And he has written up a uh, uh, very nice chapter, uh, Jeff. Uh, it's, it's pretty long uh, <laughs> to, to, to various standards, but the important thing is that it's like John's 1971 paper. Everything, almost everything we want to know about head direction systems, the big things are there. So what are those things? So there are many, many, many things. Uh, everything that we listed today is listed, almost everything is listed there. On top of that, we, recently we thought we made discoveries, but remember, research is only research. So we rediscovered that there are actually axons in the alveos of the CA1 region which have had the rationality. And uh, we just recently found that indeed you already described them in this very first chapter. So if you would like to, to reiterate what the, the message of the symposium is, I recommend you to reread or read this uh, this chapter. And the reason, Jeff, why it was not published in science, because back then, people felt that if I had published a paper that is there to read for anybody, there is no reason to duplicate it. <laughs> and, and science was not such a big deal. I think John never thought about rewriting his uh, 71 paper and publish it to, to you know, some other journal. So. There were discussions, so this is one of the discussion points. You know, remember, we already, uh, I, I forgot it was Linda Dow probably said, oh, this was an era about memory and so on, long-term potentiation and so on. And so we were right on the topic. And uh, this, is, uh, this is Jim's 
comment here. I said, well, I know a few things about how, what memory should be uh, and what, what long-term potentiation is. He said, it's a very rare event. I don't really understand what you meant by rare event, uh, the LTP, but it, I think it's going on many, many times. But th this is what you said, adjacency, the, the density, and so on should be very important. And uh, uh, the, the, Tim Bliss made a few interesting comments about uh, my proposal about sharp paste. But the debates went on and on and on, and we talked about various things such as cognition and, uh, and uh, you know, what do we do with this uh, head direction cells and play cells when it comes to the real thing, which is Brenda Milner's discovery that hippocampus has something to do with, with memory. And then this was shortcut by your comment, Jim, which is very typical of Jim. He said, well, well, we can talk, 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 talk. We have already spent half an hour and we haven't solved anything. But why don't we talk about the generation of theta written? That can be solved, and people in the room will solve it in a few years. So that hasn't happened. <laughs> we learned a lot more about the play cells, grid cells, and I think the, the field moved forward much, much faster than this very difficult thing to crack. So just fast forward, the idea that we would like to uh, salute you for your discoveries uh, came together very quickly with, the, or actually recently, with, with, the, with, with the participants around the, this table. And uh, so we discussed the agenda, and Howard Eichenbaum was uh, nice to join us. He couldn't come for this nice dinner because uh, you live far away. But uh, this is what we thought would be appropriate. So I'm very pleased that it happened. And uh, now we go fast forward, and we are, I let uh, Adrian Perash to talk about what we think uh, the head direction system gives to the rest of the uh, spatial system. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, thanks to the organizer. Beautiful meeting. Uh, quite honored to speak here and to stand here. Uh, very humbling. I like this picture because like, despite the physical appearance, you know, we all know who is the real giant here. Uh, <laughs> clearly not the guy with the red pants. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> So uh, in the five minutes left I have, uh, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna try to uh, basically show you two projects that we uh, we've been working on uh, as I was a postdoc with Yuri. Um, so the first one, and we already uh, heard a lot about this, is is, the, is is this question: is what about the head direction system? So is it uh, a system, a sensory system that is, uh, I would say, mainly driven by sensory inputs? Uh, or is it an attractor system, an uh, internally uh, organized system? Uh, just imagine here, uh, like this, here's the pointer, I hope you can see it. So the head direction cells, they code for an angle, they uh, lie on the ring. And one naive view of, of the system will be to say, well, it's for a group of neurons, as you can see here in dark red, uh, to, uh, to fire uh, together, well, you need a constant input, right? So a combination of vestibular inputs or uh, visual inputs, you name it. And we all know that it's clearly uh, not the case for the head direction system. Uh, it's pretty clear that it's an attractor network and that either with like a very transient uh, external input or even in the presence only of noise, the system will spontaneously evolve toward a state in which only a subgroup of neurons will be activated at once. And together, uh, as the animal is awake, it will represent the head direction. So how do we test it? Uh, well, one idea we had was that during spontaneous activity, for example, during sleep, uh, an internally organized system should exhibit a coherent rep uh, internal representation. So in order to do that, uh, we uh, implanted silicon probes, like high-density silicon probes, uh, in both the thalamus, uh, anterior dorsal nucleus, and the post uh, You're all familiar with this uh, circuit now. And uh, Yuri, you know, was kind enough to uh, let me waste a lot of probes uh, until I managed to, uh, to do it. Uh, but finally, uh, one day, uh, you get a great recording. And, and what we got, uh, because like leveraging, you know, this uh, technology of high density probes, we managed to record a lot of head direction neurons uh, simultaneously, both uh, in the anterior dorsal nucleus. And you see here, there are tuning curves, uh, 15 cells recorded simultaneously. 
And in the same animal, simultaneously, this is one session in the post ubiquinum, also uh, like here, like 11 uh, head, direction cells, head direction cells. Um, and to, to make a long story brief, basically here uh, what we observed. So what we you have on the right is, uh, where is the pointer here? Uh, what you have on the right is the activity, the smooth activity, the smooth spike train of, uh, I guess, 20 neurons in the thalamus, right? So each line is one, the activity of one neuron. You have the uh, hippocampal LFP uh, behind, uh, below here, that tells us about the brain state. The animal is awake. And what you see here in color code is uh, weighted sum of the receptive fields weighted by their uh, instantaneous activity at time zero here. And no surprise, as the animal is uh, exploring a square box, here you only see this uh, head orientation moving, you have this activity packet moving along on the ring. Uh, it's pretty slow here. And, uh, and basically this internal needle of the compass moving uh, with, uh, as the animal is turning its head. So no big surprise, it was kind of great to see it with so many neurons at once, uh, but there was nothing really, uh, nothing really new here. But the question is obviously what happens during sleep. So now we're gonna show you exactly the same neurons, exactly the same animal, uh, but as the animal is sleeping. So the first half of this video, it's non-REM sleep, uh, non-rapid eye movement or slow wave sleep, uh, big, you know, uh, slow waves, uh, sharp waves in the hippocampus, and halfway I'll show you uh, the, uh, the, the brain state shift uh, abruptly to, uh, to REM sleep. So it's played at the same speed, which I guess is half the, the actual speed. So now you see that the, the activity packet on the ring is still preserved. It's only one subset of neurons active at uh, each time, kind of noisy sometimes, and it sweeps very rapidly. Uh, and, and it's pretty, uh, the video is slow, that's fine. And now you're gonna see it's gonna shift to REM sleep <coughs> right now. So you have the first theta waves looking at the bottom, and now this activity packet, the needle stabilizes, and it will start to drift slow, much slower now. So it's a continuous recording, right? So you see that the transition uh, first between the two brain states, but also in the dynamics of the system, is very abrupt. Uh, so I remember actually that we saw that for the very first recording we ever had, Yuri, and uh, I sent him the example, uh, and we were uh, really excited about it. So we, we, we did uh, uh, some more uh, analysis. I, I'm not going to show you everything, obviously. Uh, let me show you basically what I think uh, summarizes uh, the best, uh, the, uh, the entire result. So if you look at raster, classical raster plot, here each line, of course, is, uh, is one neuron, the color code for the uh, preferred direction, both in the post ubiquinum and uh, the enterodosal nucleus, you see this activity packet, this is the uh, here the head direction, and in both directions, like in both structures moving together, but also during slow sleep or non-REM and REM sleep, okay? The, and, and you see that the activity packet is basically looking exactly the same in all brain states. The main difference here is the time scale below. So it's 10 times faster during non-REM. Another way to look at it is to look at cross-correlation between the pairs of neurons. So the first row are two cells with strongly overlapping tuning curves. And, and you look at the cross uh between the two spike trains, meaning what is the probability of one neuron to spike after the spike of, a, of another cell, basically. And, and you see it's very picky for these two neurons in all brain state, sure. Overlapping tuning curves, they tend to fire together. Uh, but again, the width of that peak is much smaller uh, during uh, non-REM or slow sleep. Now, if you take two cells that fire 180 degrees uh, from each other, they will never ever fire together during wake, as expected, but they will never ever fire together during non-REM or during REM. And again, the dynamics uh, is, is compressed. So this was uh, really exciting to us. Uh, here you can, you, know, you can see all the cell pairs in the thalamus. Important thing, so it's the same cross-color graphs now that are color-coded, uh, sorted by uh, angular offset in the cell pair. Again, you see the compression factor, look at the time scale here compare, compared to wake and REM. And you see also that if you look at the uh, number of cells, basically, that are positively correlated with each other, which basically is the size of the activity packet, it's exactly the same in all brain states. So it means that there is an activity packet that's exactly the same in all brain states. The only difference is that it's 10 times faster, like it moves 10 times faster during slow sleep. So 
to um, quick summary first uh, about this, uh, these results is that, well, that was another evidence. There are already like so many uh, experimental and theoretical papers that have uh, said that this was an attractor network. We think that basically uh, it's kind of a, of a new one here. And what is interesting is that the internal representation is state invariant, and there is like a circuit here that is hardwired, built in, and, and, and it's very important for the navigation system because it ensures that they will they, there's only one needle at any time. You just imagine that if you had like a navigation system in which there they could be like two needles, you don't want that. So it has to be uh, only one. And, uh, and, and, and that to me, what is even more fascinating is that the internal dynamics is also pre-wired. Uh, the fact that during RAM sleep, the needle kind of moves at the same speed as during wake means that the system is dynamically already tuned to uh, the animal's behavior. And you just need some you know, uh, inputs uh, from the vestibular nucleus and subthalamic uh, nuclei to basically bias the content of this, uh, of this system. Jeff, <laughs> you said something in your talk. Uh, you know, actually, we never say that. Um, I, 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 I totally agree with you. Uh, we, I know that the attractor is very, very likely to be in the subthalamic nuclei. Uh, and I'm also pretty sure that there's nothing going on in the post uh, I've looked, for example, at uh, excitatory collaterals between head erection cells. I found, I guess, total of a couple cells that were connected to each other. So meaning there is no... Uh, excitatory network, like, you know, uh, collaterals that will support an attractor in the post -tubicinum. However, in the thalamus, I will be damn surprised that there is nothing happening between AD and the reticular nucleus, the inhibitory network. Uh, I have some evidences already that there might be something happening. So there will be like a, an attractor in the subthalamic uh, nuclei that will project on another attractor like a ring attractor, and that projection will actually ensure that the thalamus, what is transmitted from the thalamus, is an angular value and only an angular value, right? If, it's, uh, if, the, if it is uh, the way it's hardwired, this is what will be transferred and uh, transmitted. Fine. Um, so next, uh, we, we had this other question. Uh, so we know the head direction signal is the building block for the navigation, uh, for navigation for the cognitive map. But how, how does it happen? I, I'm going to do a lot of shortcuts. I apologize in advance uh, to everyone here that has, you all have published so much uh, on, on this. But basically, this is the way I will summarize it. Um, again, I'm not, I don't want to go into the debate where is the path integrator in the hippocampus or the grid cells. I don't know. But what we know is that basically you have internal idiotatic signals, uh, head direction signal and the speak signal that can be integrated in time and that will update the current estimate of the position. Uh, that's not enough because you need to calibrate it and align it to the environment. So there are external inputs to the system, for example, local views uh, or all the sensor information. Uh, here, if I am on 20th Street and uh, I see the Empire still building that way, I'm pretty sure that I am at the corner with the Fifth Avenue and that actually I'm pointing north. So this is also important to align the head direction signal. There, there should be like a, an arrow here. And very importantly, uh, you must have a definition of a border. Uh, that is not only necessary to reset the path integrator, they are beautiful behavioral experiments from uh, Ariane Etienne, for example, uh, also uh, neuronal uh, evidences for that. And you need to calibrate the spatial representation. You need to know, like, this is how the space uh, looks like, and now I can build a, a spatial code within it. And play cells, as uh, John uh, has pointed out, could also be, like, how far I am from a wall, from two orthogonal walls, for example. So, what puzzled me here is where this border signal comes from, and there is not a lot of evidences for that. Uh, the other thing that puzzled me is the following. So if you look at the distribution of head direction information in the thalamus, in the AD, it's very high, these are head direction cells. In the post economy, you see it's like clearly a very tail, but there's a lot of head direction information there. And in the uh, hippocampus, it's very low, and there are a few head direction cells, as I will show you, and that, as Yuri just said. But spatial information is pretty high everywhere. It's higher in the, in the hippocampus, but it's already pretty high in the thalamus. And I was a bit puzzled by that. So I look at the data, and, and actually everybody has, uh, has seen it before, uh, before me, and uh, Neil was talking about it before. So it's not a big surprise. It's like here you have a head direction cell from the thalamus, 
And if you look now uh, as a more you know, uh, classical plot, animal movement, journey, pass in gray, red dots is a spike. You look at its place field, it's actually clearly not uniform. It tends to fire along the uh, two walls here, parallel to the uh, tuning curve. And you can compute an actual spatial information for the, for, from, that, uh, from that place field. And it's not as high as a place cell in CA1, but it's already pretty high. OK, but is there real spatial information in there? Well, actually, no. Uh, the way you can, sh there are different ways to show it. Actually, Neil uh, had another way in one of a paper like about 10 years ago. Uh, you can take the tuning curve, you know it, so you assume the tuning curve, you know the head direction, and you can build like a very simple Poisson process that will fire knowing the head direction and the tuning curve. And you generate a spike train like this that you can see here in black, the red, the red being the actual one. And you have basically more or less exactly the same place field meaning that this place field is only explained by the head direction tuning curve. There's no spatial correlate within the uh, firing of that neuron. And if you compute the spatial information here, it's basically the same, and the difference is almost zero. OK, so, uh, well, here it's uh, another way to look at the behavior of the animal. You see that it's highly constrained along the walls, and the animal is, tends to always uh, run uh, along the walls. I can, I'm not going into these details. So I, I couldn't help thinking that actually it was too bad for the system not to use that uh, kind of spatial information. So I look a bit further into now, not the thalamus, but in the post data, and I found some cells like this. So now this is a head direction cell pointing south, but it fires only along one wall. And now if you compute like spatial information and the remaining spatial information after, you know, uh, uh, after removing uh, what was, uh, you can compute with a fake one, an artificial one, it was actually pretty high, it looked like true spatial information. And if you now look at the same cell, when the wall was on the left only, so the, the animal was like moving this way, or when the wall was on the right, you see that it's totally different. So the cell should have fired a lot here but it didn't. So what you could do, you can just like regress uh, the fine rate of that neuron with a general, uh, generalized linear model, for example. And what you see is that this cell is clearly positively modulated by the east wall and not by the other ones. And you can do another kind of regression, uh, which is wall on the left versus wall on the right. And you see that actually this cell is strongly biased by the body-centered, I would say, uh, position of the animal. If you look now, in the population, you see that this border modulation actually explains some of this unbiased information, meaning the true spatial information conveyed by the cells in the post tubiculum, not in the thalamus. So where this signal could come from? Uh, that signal that is combined with the head direction signal to, to, to generate, like to increase the amount of spatial information. Well, recently, the Svoboda lab at General Farm published something very interesting to me, is in the barrel cortex, and it's just an example. Um, in the barrel cortex, there are cells that code for uh, the distance from the wall. And this is exactly the kind of signal you need. So you, 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 you know that you activate the, your right whiskers, for example, there's a wall on your right. You combine it with a head direction signal, and suddenly you double, effectively, the amount of spatial information conveyed by the neuron. Right? So again, we go back to this very, you know, uh, like very, uh, uh, this, this diagram of how to generate place information, and then we can add that actually the head direction signal could be also used uh, this way. I'm almost done here. Uh, and, uh, but for the pass integrator, you still need a head direction signal. So where does it come from? Uh, we know that AD projects to the post tubiculum, but it's actually also projected everywhere, in the medial and terminal cortex, in the deep layers, in the subiculum, in the uh, retrospinal cortex. And, where, like, you need a true head direction signal to, 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 to calibrate, like, actually to up, uh, update the pass integrator. And what we found, as Yuri was saying, is head direction cell in the in CA1, and this is a recording done by Lisa here. Hi, Lisa. Uh, one day they call me, it's like, look at, look at this. So this is dorsal CA1, the color code for the power of ripples. So it was with a silicon probe, we could see, like, beautiful ripples at the bottom, and a head direction cell here on the very medial part, almost at the border with uh, the subiconum. And one thing I didn't tell you is that the head direction cells in the thalamus are highly synchronous, like cells with overlapping tuning curve, but now at a millisecond time range. 
And that synchrony is very likely to be transmitted to the post-tubiculum. So it's a very efficient way to recruit post-tubicular cells. But now you have the same synchrony in the post-tubiculum between AD and post-tubiculum, delayed by the actual delay, by two to three milliseconds. What we observe between heterection cell in the hippocampus and the AD is surprising. It's a synchrony now at the millisecond time range, but at zero, right? So it's very unlikely that it's, axon, that it's a, a postsynaptic cell. So, and here it's like the average of head direction cells and not head direction cells. So what is it? Um, another piece of evidence is that these cells, presumably cells, are not tetamodulated, exactly as weakly modulated as cells in the AD. So the question now is like, do we see here axons? Do we see presynaptic buttons? We don't know yet, uh, so we'll have to explore it a bit further. Uh, and to finish, as I was saying, so basically this is, I would say, classical way of like looking at a pathway of head direction signal, uh, and 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 we're just thinking about maybe we should think about this system as a distributed system in which AD projects to multiple areas, and this signal is used in different ways for different purposes. Let me just thank everyone, Yuri of course, and the student that helped me out and the people who gave me money for that. Thank you. So, Jim, we are done with the easy part because we are two-dimensional. But some of our relatives actually are in 3D, and uh, those must have a different type of uh, ring attractor. <laughs>